Well, thanks very much uh, for uh, uh, including my paper in the, in the conference. It's great to be here and great to be amongst uh, many old friends and, and colleagues. So um, today's talk is meant to give you sort of uh, an overview and rationale behind the exhibition uh, that I curated at the National Library next door called Gutter, India and the Gulf, History, Society and Culture, um, which looks at uh, 4,600 years of connections between the Indian subcontinent, or what I call historical India, uh, and uh, the wider Gulf region. Uh, you can also read about it in this exhibition catalog, which is available for free. So tomorrow when I take you on the tour, you can also get a free copy of this from the information desk. We just printed 300 more copies, so make sure you get yourself one. This uh, exhibition is actually just, although it's 200 pages, it's just the headlines of uh, my next book, which is called uh, India and the Gulf, Trade Society and Empire Across the Indian Ocean. It looks at the, the two uh, high points uh, uh, of, of, of interaction between India and the Gulf from the establishment of the Estado de India and the, and the incorporation of the lower Gulf into that uh, in the early 1500s up to the end of the British Raj in 1947. And it looks at the broad spectrum of, of connections, not just empire, but trade, culture, uh, religion, uh, and so on. Uh, this uh, talk is uh, going to have three different parts. Uh, one is the overview, just sort of to give you the headlines of the uh, connections between the two regions over uh, 4,600 years. Uh, and then I'll go into some of the, the dependency, historical dependency of the Gulf, especially Eastern Arabia, on India and how significant that was. And then finally, I'll look at the implications of all of this. Uh, the implications being that what, what, what occurred, what emerged, was uh, something I'm calling a zone of cultural confluence uh, from the, the shores of, uh, of, of Kerala all the way to Arabia. Oops, where am I going? Uh, India and the Gulf have been interconnected from time immemorial, despite being geographically separate. The waters connecting the, the two regions are, in fact, the world's ult oldest cultural crossroads. The earliest written account of Indians in the Gulf is this cuneiform tablet from the 23rd or 24th century uh, BC, uh, which is written in Akkadian, and if you read uh, cuneiform, it's written left to right and then in columns. So in the fifth column, uh, halfway down, it says, He, King Sargon, moored the ships of Mahola, uh, which was the uh, Gulf's name for, for the Indus Valley, uh, Megan, which is Oman, uh, and Dillon, Bahrain, at the key of uh, Akkad. Akkad is sort of in central Iraq. So this gives us, this is the earliest written account of a connection um, between the Gulf uh, and India. But the oldest archaeological evidence uh, in the Gulf region dates from around 2600 BC. That's archaeological evidence. The oldest um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm having a moment. The oldest uh, 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 Alternative forms of evidence suggest that there has been connections uh, between the two regions going back six millennia before that. Uh, but this is this is uh, the, the hard archaeological evidence is what all archaeologists uh, uh, go by, uh, which is 2600 BC. Since the invention of seagoing vessels, there has been maritime trade between India and the Gulf. Starting uh, with the Indus Valley, uh, oh, sorry, starting uh, with trade between the Indus Valley and Mesopotamia. Although overland trade uh, is much older and predates recorded history. Throughout this time, India has always loomed large over the horizon, attracting uh, most of the Gulf's uh, exports uh, and supplying much of what made life possible before oil. The Gulf's ancient maritime connections with the Indian subcontinent and the deep interlinking between the Gulf and India are symbolized by Sinbad the Sailor of 1001 Nights fame. Sinbad is a fictional Arab merchant from Baghdad who sailed uh, from Basra to India and beyond 
through the wider Indian Ocean during the reign uh, of uh, Baghdad Caliph uh, Harun uh, al Rashid, uh, who ruled in the uh, late uh, 700s. Sinbad, the Sinbad stories originated from ancient sailors' yarns, like those collected by the famous Persian ship's captain Ram Hormuzi, uh, who died in uh, 1009. Uh, which he wrote in his book, The uh, Book of Wonders of India, uh, which was a compilation of accounts published or well, written in the 10th century. In Persian, Sinbad means the wind of Sind. Now, Sind, of course, as you know, is the region of the Indian subcontinent closest to the Gulf, which gives its also, also gives its name to the Sindhu Sagar, the Sindhi Sea, which uh, is what the Arabian Sea was known before the Arab conquest of Sind in 711-712. Sinbad, therefore, may have been the nickname referring to the winds that carried Gulf Dows to and from India for millennia. Sindhis were also the largest demographic group of South Asian merchants in the port towns of the Gulf. Other major sending regions were Kutch and Gujarat, which since the 1960s form uh, Gujarat state. Historically, India, or the South Asian presence uh, in the Gulf region most likely predates recorded history. It could go back, as I said, as far back as eight, eight millennia. Historically, uh, sorry, before the oil era, most Indians came from one of these groups. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the uh, South Asian presence or Indian presence uh, in the Gulf region was very diverse. Uh, and one thing I discovered, which I published separately a few years ago, uh, is, is a study of these groups. There's about uh, at least 36 uh, uh, South Asian uh, communities that were historically present in the Gulf over the last several thousand years. And of course, this changes with, with time. Um, the exhibition talks about this in much more detail, so I'll move on here. But here are a few examples. This is a, uh, a Kutchi uh, a Bhatia Hindu family in Muscat, about 1910. Uh, and here is a uh, Dewudi uh, Bora family from Gujarat in Manama uh, in around the you know, 1940s. Today, the Indian connection with the Gulf is more apparent than ever before, with the presence of over 8 million Indian expats uh, living and working in the GCC states. And of course, if you include uh, South Asians as a whole, then it's obviously much greater than that. Uh, and this gives the, the, the neighborhoods in which they predominate the feel of Indian towns, to, to the extent that uh, neighborhoods uh, in these towns are regarded really as an extension of, of India. Uh, people feel like they're still at home rather than overseas. Um, another thing connecting India and the, and, the, and the Gulf is empire. So uh, I've identified uh, 15 separate occasions in which parts of the Gulf region and parts of uh, historical India, the Indian subcontinent, uh, were part of the same empire. So this... this uh, is just a reflection of the fact that the two regions were economically interconnected and really are part of a wider zone. Because often what was driving empire was, was, was economics and trade. Now I'll talk a bit about the historical dependency of, of the Gulf on India. The Gulf region, especially Eastern Arabia, was historically dependent on India for much of what, uh, and may, sorry, for what, for much of what made life uh, possible. Uh, money, material, and food. Um, this dependency is nicely summarized by an article from the London Times from 1945, which says, the Persian Gulf has even closer ties with India than with Iraq, Egypt, and the Levant. Most of its trade is with India. Food supplies come from India, and Bombay is the market for pearls before they are sent to Europe. The number of Arabs who travel to the Gulf uh, travel from the Gulf to Egypt is small in comparison with the number who pay regular and lengthy visits to India. The political future of India is a matter of much more interest here than the, than the situation in Palestine. And this was pretty much the norm um, up until uh, the uh, 1950s when everything changed. Uh, 
the exhibition doesn't talk too much about this, but um, what happened in the 1950s was a, uh, a cultural and economic reorientation of Eastern Arabia away from the Indian Ocean and towards the Arab world and, and the West beyond it uh, for a number of factors. Uh, one is the arrival of oil uh, and oil wealth and oil revenue and uh, the GCC states as they are now uh, looked to the West to supply the architects, uh, the engineering, uh, and, and so on to, to build the modern states that we, we now see. But also the arrival of Arab nationalism, uh, thanks to Palestinian and Iraqi and Syrian and Egyptian uh, teachers, uh, and, and then with the voice of uh, the Arabs from Egypt, and then of course Nasser, uh, there was a, uh, if you want to call it an awakening, but certainly a, 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 an, a, an emergence, but mostly a generational one of, of Arabs in, who were in their 20s and the 1950s, who began to, to realize that they're part of something wider, uh, something larger called the Arab world. Uh, and this was a generational shift, and you begin to see, therefore, uh, a, a reorientation away from the Indian Ocean uh, towards the, the Arab world. Um, and the, the, the introduction of the term Arabian Gulf as opposed to Persian Gulf was a part of this wider reorientation. Uh, virtually all large-scale economic activity in Eastern Arabia, such as pearling and the import-export export sector, was funded by credit and loans from Hindu merchants, mainly Katri Banyans, like uh, uh, this man here is a Katri, from Multan in southwest Punjab uh, and uh, Shikapur in north Sindh. The, the Katris, because of the uh, uh, unfortunate history of Multan, it was under siege a number of times. The, uh, many of the, the uh, uh, money, uh, money men moved uh, south to uh, Singapore, where it was uh, more stable, and then later in the in the uh, 19th century, they eventually moved to Bombay. So the the financial capital of of the Gulf region was was in India, was not here because uh, large scale capital was simply not available locally uh, to to fund uh, pearling expeditions and uh, import export sector. This financial dependency was symbolized by the widespread use of the hundi, which is an Indian bill of exchange or promissory note, like an IOU, uh, and the rupee in the Gulf. The rupee was the unofficial, sorry, was the official currency of Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the Emirates, and Oman until their own currencies were introduced in the 1960s. And today, the one real coin in Qatar, the one dirham coin in the Emirates, and the 100 fill coin, which is one tenth of a dinar, in Kuwait and Bahrain are still known as the rupiah uh, by the older generation, reflecting their similar size and look to the rupee, as well as their original exchange rate. That is, one rupee equals one Qatari rial, one Emirati dirham, and 100 uh, Kuwaiti and Bahraini fills. So that's why all of these currencies are uh, related to each other in that way. Almost everything to sustain life in Eastern Arabia was imported, and the largest supplier of goods was India. The, uh, now, the last thing I'd like to mention uh, is the implications of all of this, and I ran out of time to provide you with uh, uh, slides, but uh, you'll see it in the exhibition tomorrow. The shorelines of the Arabian Sea and the Gulf, uh, as a result of this, were a zone of cultural uh, confluence. Over the course of millennia, um, the people inhabiting these shores developed into cultural cousins. Uh, and in the case of the uh, Indo-Arab uh, Mapla community of Kerala, blood cousins. Although many Gulf merchant families also had blood ties to India. And these people are the physical embodiment of these connections. And there are multiple examples of, of, of this uh, zone of cultural uh, confluence. The exhibition, uh, of course, takes for granted uh, Islam. Uh, and spread of Islam through uh, India, which of course came from the Gulf, mainly from Iran. Uh, there is also Zoroastrianism, uh, Parsis, uh, of course, uh, after the rise of Islam in Iran, moved to, to Gujarat and then later to Bombay. Uh, and that, that keeps, if you go to Bombay today, you'll, you'll see Bombay is very largely, uh, predominantly sort of uh, Parsi, uh, the old, old Bombay is a largely uh, Parsi-dominated area. Most of the buildings that public uh, 
buildings that have been built were, were funded by Parsi uh, merchants. We have shared traditions, of course, uh, henna being probably the most visible one, uh, and shared material culture, such as the uh, Kashmiri shawl, which was made in India uh, uh, for the Gulf market and used as, as an Arab headdress, and is today, of course, regarded um, you know, uncritically as, as an Arab headdress, even though uh, it is clearly from Kashmir. But this, this headdress symbolizes how unproblematic uh, the incorporation of material culture from India into Gulf culture uh, was, and perhaps still is. Uh, so the exhibition also looks at karak chai and biryani, which are national cuisine in, in Qatar and, and in the Emirates, uh, even though their origins, of course, are, are India. Uh, and so for this and a variety of other reasons, I argue in the exhibition uh, that uh, South Asians... Uh, and uh, uh, Khalijis are, are really cultural cousins. They have a lot in common, but are blinded by, I guess, the, the uh, 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 you know, by nationalism, which, which uh, tends to uh, emphasize one's own uh, um, cultural autonomy uh, from, from neighboring regions. So the, the exhibition tries to uh, step back from that and show just how interdependent it was and looks at the borrowings in both directions. Another example would be the, the extensive prevalence of Arabic and Persian in South Asian languages. There's a number of examples in the exhibition looking at Hindi uh, and Urdu, uh, but also of, of, of Hindi uh, loanwords in, in Gulf Arabic. So there's, there's an extensive amount of borrowing back and forth. Um, this was just intended to be the headlines to uh, whet your appetite for tomorrow's tour. So uh, I will leave it at that, but please uh, remember to pick up a copy of the catalog, which goes into, obviously, a lot more detail, even more detail than you'll find in the exhibition, because we, we didn't have enough space to include all of the text. So there'll be a lot more text in the, in the, uh, in the catalog. And that sums it up. Thank you very much. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is Thinking Between and Beyond Nodes Cross Gulf Connections from 1870 to 1840. And um, I'm very happy to come right after James because he's taken the long view and now we're going to go very narrowly in. On October 10th, 1936, Sheikh Abdullah of Bandar Kalat, here in the, the Red Star, um, with his sons and several others, surrounded the customs administration of the port and locked up all of the central government officials inside. Over the next five hours, the entire town of Kalat proceeded to pack their belongings and board the ships waiting to take them to the other side of the Gulf. The next day, the customs administration reported to the Ministry of Interior um, that the village was, quote, empty of residents. Once a substantial town of roughly 2,500 people, um, just on the outskirts of Bandarlinge, the, the population of Kalat today is around 77. It fluctuates between 77 and 86. But I don't know which one is exactly, under 100. Um, but when the village of Kalat uh, disappeared overnight, the Kalatis weren't sailing into a watery abyss. They knew exactly where they were going. But from the perspective of the Iranian officials, this story seems like a very local one, and for them, it's just an example of small-scale resistance uh, to the central Iranian state, their kind of village who got away. But today, I want to talk about how the short-range connection between Kalat and the Trucial Coast, as we know it at that time, um, which is roughly 200 kilometers um, 120 miles, was in fact tied up to broader currents floated, flowing between the Gulf and the Indian Ocean. Until the modern period, it was common for people to move in the face of economic, political, and environmental difficulties. Historically, the major Gulf ports uh, were prim primarily interposed for the transshipment of goods, produ producing very little of what they exported. This meant that for communities with very few permanent structures and little agricultural investment, the cost of relocating was um, pretty low. 
And um, Larry Potter has, has called this uh, boat capital and, and argues that this is the primary form of capital, so it's very easily transferable. So when the people moved, they took trade and commerce with them, which meant that these towns um, moved along the shoreline. So over time, we see the scaling down of major port nodes around the western Indian Ocean and their replacement by the rise of another port nearby. <clears throat> For example, archaeologists have documented the transition of trade and people from Risha to Sirach to Sohar to Hormuz from the 8th to 16th century. Oh, Jim, this is the way that the city is moved. <clears throat> um, many of the examples of the shifting cities are in the pre-modern era, but there are some important ones um, in the modern era as well. Um, for this crowd, I think... The most obvious one is the move from Surat to Bombay. Um, and, but this is sort of a phenomenon throughout the, the entire Indian Ocean. Now, British imperial Im involvement played no small role in determining which ports would survive into the 20th century and which ones would be passed over in favor of others. The protection treaties that they contracted um, introduced, uh, especially in the Gulf, introduced new power dynamics that kept particular rulers in place, um, and the technologies of empire uh, physically transformed the major ports in a way that discouraged people from leaving, as they had in, in previous centuries. The British, however, are a very long way from Kalat, it seems. Um, so this area, this little town, which is located in the Bandarlinga province, um, is a collective of coastal villages called the Shipkuh Coast. So all of the arrows pointing away here, are, this is the Shipkuh Coast. Um, they lie on a flat plain between the Gulf and the Zagros Mountains. If you've ever flown over it, it's quite striking just how flat the coast is and how high up the... And this is my like hand-drawn map, uh, but the, the mountains are, are quite high behind them. So in the 19th century, the primary means of travel between these villages was by way of small fishing, fishing boats. Um, the first road for wheel traffic wasn't built until the late 1920s. And these boats carried local products such as salt, charcoal, firewood, salt fish, um, and pearls to Bandarlinga to be traded. They brought back foodstuffs from the Iranian interior and the Gulf, as well as items from further afield such as coffee, fabric, and gold thread, and you can all guess where those might be coming from. Um, and in the second, the second half of the 19th century, Bandar Linge, um had become the center of a booming trade, the booming trade between the Gulf and India. And by some accounts, it's, the trade quintupled between 1845 and 1865. So Linga was the most important entrepot in the Gulf for goods entering and, and exiting the region. And um, it was a critical node between connecting southern Mesopotamia, Iran, the Arabian Peninsula, um, India, East Africa, to the Far East. Now, the, co the connections between ports across long distances has been likened to a string of pearls that links the Indian Ocean world. As a side note, string of pearls is also some, like, Chinese Jew strategy. The name of some Jew strategies. If you Google string of pearls, a lot of different things will come up. Um, but this image of the string of pearls is how we generally tend to think of the Indian Ocean more broadly, focusing on um, some deeply ingrained commonalities uh, that extend from one side of the ocean to the other. So even today we've heard about um, similar reliance on um, monsoon patterns, similar, like, a shared literal culture. And in this schema, the string of nodal pearls, if you will, and the water in between sort of define this realm of the Indian Ocean world. So while this image helps us to kind of envision the expanse uh, of the Indian Ocean and the centrality of ports in that, um, the string of pearls is limited in its analytic value due to its flatness. And I think I'm like the fourth person who's used the word flatness today. Um, there are a lot, a lot of flat things going on. Um, the string of pearls, it doesn't really model or explain the complexity of relationships uh, between the nodes. 
So some were more connected to uh, specific, specific ones than others. Um, direction of traffic sort of depended on the season, what you were trading. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're you know, critical points of uh, juncture points between these different kinds of circulation. Um, and finally, the, the sort of linearity of movement that this string of pearl suggests was certainly not always the case. In the historiography of the 19th and early 20th century Western Indian Ocean, the nodes that we tend to cite to string together our narrative are most often uh, major nodes. So, for example, Zanzibar, Aden, Mustat, uh, Kuwait, Basra, Boucher, Bahrain, Karachi, Bombay, Linga, that, like, there are plenty of major ones, uh, uh, and these are just, and these are the ones that usually make the map. Now, these nodes are familiar ports of call for steamships and for the annual Safar voyage, um, but they were also home to, um, to some form of official uh, British colonial presence as well. Um, so there's, to some extent, the, the easily accessible archive is sort of dictating which ports get strung on our string. Um, but we should keep in mind that as fundamental as this the movements between these major ports were, um, they're only a part of the story. And I want to talk now a little bit about the other part of the story. So every day, ships of all sizes move back and forth across the Gulf and along the coast, um, moving between, between places whose names um, often show up only on the most detailed of maps, like this one. I don't think uh, Bender Kalat actually made this map. Um, so this short-range trade, uh, locally called al-qida'a, um, was mostly ignored by the British record, except when being accused of uh, smuggling contraband or slaves. So these small ships in engaged in this trade, um, redistributing goods throughout between the major nodes um, and the smaller coastal nodes. So this small-scale trade was important for bringing... Um, goods from these small villages into the center, so hence the, the entrepot. al qaeda was, criti was critical for making this entire system of trade work due to the fact that the major nodes were entrepots. Um, they weren't in and of themselves major consumers of the, the goods that they imported. At the same time that they were redistributing to smaller nodes along the coast, they also benefited from importing from a variety of sources um, in order to export to the Indian Ocean market. So when we began to take this, uh, this short-range trade into consideration, the connections between nodes began to look more like a complex, tangled web. And can you believe that there is a web of pearls? Um, the Internet is a fantastic place. Um, <laughs> the, the fact that the major nodes of the Gulf, like Linga, were critical junctures for connecting um, items like charcoal from Kalat to fires in Karachi meant that the ports were entangled in a variety of flows, short and long distance ones, that were equally critical to their survival. Now, speaking of survival, let's go back to Bandar Linge and Kalat to look at how these sort of multi leveled uh, connections play out in history. I mentioned earlier that Linga in the 19th century had become the Gulf entrepot par excellence, and um, trade had become especially lucrative um, in, towards the end of the 19th century. And as that trade became lucrative, um, the central Iranian government became increasingly more interested in Linga and um, ruling more or less directly, whereas before it had been fairly independent. Um, <clears throat> But all this really boiled down to, at least initially, directly taxing um, the Im both the imports and ex exports. So this meant the end of local sovereignty um, as the central government put their um, customs administration, their own officials in the customs administration. So by 1901, a 5% tax was levied on imports and exports. And because the majority of goods coming into Linga were not staying there and were supposed to be going back out, um, a 10% tax all of a sudden was really crippling. So to avoid the tax, the merchants and traders began to look 
for alternative options to Lenke. <clears throat> Pearling merchants were among the first to leave, uh, many relocating to Bahrain, which was actually closer to the pearl bags anyway. Um, and their, as their capital was primarily movable, this was a, a clean, cleaner break for them. Um, but for those of the Shibhu coast, like in Bandar Kilat, um, whose livelihood was tied to the land, they began carrying goods across the water to trade. And this pivot to trading along the coast, um, trading from trading along the coast to across the water, was not actually such a big leap for them. The Shipku, Shipku villages um, were populated by various tribes who had moved, who had migrated to that side um, genera- several generations prior, and they'd main, maintained. Um, connections, often marrying people from the other side and whatnot. Um, so rather than deal with the taxes at Linge, they just decided to make a longer journey to the Trucial Coast where there were no taxes. Eventually, though, it wasn't just the cult- coastal mer- merchants who began trading in places like Dubai. Traders from internal regions like Lor, uh, Avaz, which is Awal, um, and Bestek, <coughs> who had previously relied on Linge, opened up new routes to the Shibku coast in order to reroute their trade through Dubai and Bahrain. And by the late 1920s and 30s, uh, the merchant, merchants from all around the Gulf actually began to flock to Dubai. For example, the well-known Kuwaiti merchant Yusuf and Marzouk um, posted shipping agents in Dubai and Sharjah for the explicit purpose of smuggling silk from India into the Linga district without having to go to Linga itself. So in 1936, when the village of Kalat left for what the Iranians referred to as Omanat, um, the Kalatis set sail towards new emporiums that the Shipku traders had been building up since the turn of the 20th century. Intimately familiar with the coastline, they continued to run this small-scale uh, smuggling networks back and forth across the water. These nearly invisible nodes that connected the Shibku coast to both Linge, Dubai, and Bahrain played a critical role in keeping the trade alive and ultimately redirecting the entrepot trade, uh, which was so critical for the Gulf, away from Linge in the 19th century towards Bahrain and Dubai in the 20th. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Emilio Cambay-Venschutz. I'm a third-year PhD student at the History Department at Cornell. Um, and uh, I really want to use this space to present part of my preliminary research as I work on formulating my prospectus and thinking about my project and the interventions I would like to make with my dissertation. Uh, firstly, on a slightly personal note, I would like to thank uh, George and Qatar, particularly Rafael Busharaf, uh, Uday Chandra for the invitation. Um, and as a Georgetown Qatar alum, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's kind of a really uh, exciting intellectual uh, homecoming. Um, so, yes, um, and I'm particularly excited to be here surrounded by many of you whose work I'm reading uh, and I'm uh, thinking with and about while. Uh, reading for my exams, Um, and it's really a rare opportunity to be presenting next to the people whose, again, work I'm I'm, I'm reading uh, while preparing for my exams. So thank you. Uh, So in this work in progress, I'm looking at 19th century slave markets in Zanzibar and Mofkat in particular. Uh, This image here, uh, which appeared in an 1860 issue of the Illustrated London News, I think the big slave markets... uh, And one of the questions I'd like to explore um, is some of the ways in which uh, markets were discursively produced and not necessarily as spatially bounded. Uh, In this work, I focus on space, imperialism, and memorialization as important characteristics of Western Indian Ocean slave markets in the context of British sources and in the context of Britain and its growing imperial presence in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, I attempt to show how first-hand accounts are really developed in dialect with anti-slavery discourses. Uh, And in this respect, it's important to keep in mind the politics, the policies, and the personalities of uh, different British observers. So 
Uh, a number of descriptions uh, indicate anxieties over ideas of civilization, uh, which were really used to justify imperial presence in the region. Now, the idea has been put forward by others uh, like Jeremy Presswold or Matt Hopper. Uh, but I think it's interesting to see kind of this, how the space shows a, a very clear link with, with uh, geopolitical developments and with later uh, uh, imperial presence and establishment of, of uh, protectorates by the end of the century. Uh, so a mix of fascination and disgust are common elements in the descriptions. Uh, and market features uh, are unfolding for the visitors uh, with auctions, uh, inspections, uh, commentary on gender dynamics. Um, and slaves are really represented as static bodies with no agencies, which is really put in contrast with the Arab, quote unquote, uh, really active traders. Uh, so here I have a quote uh, by uh, Malcolm, who was a uh, government of Bombay in the 1820s, uh, who visited the Muscat uh, slave market. Um, and then the two on the right uh, are the only known photos that I have uh, come across of the slave market in Zanzibar. And these are two stereoscopic uh, photographs by James Grant, who was a Scottish explorer, uh, who was visiting uh, Zanzibar as part of a wider uh, imperial mission to look for, for uh, the source of the Nile uh, at the time. Now, one of the interesting things uh, is that sources, the British sources are not necessarily concerned with understanding the nuances of slavery, um, nor of the slave trade, but rather with exposing a space that showcased its visibility. Uh, so regardless of its location, uh, Moscat or Zanzibar, markets are described using a very similar language, uh, and they really present a unitary vision of slave markets. Uh, there wasn't a, a difference for the observers between Moscow, Zanzibar, uh, other places like Kilwa or even Shadra uh, in the Gulf. Um, and one of the main concerns seemed to have been that of the market's public and mobile aspects, uh, which really contradicts the idea of one kind uh, of fixed unitary market. Here there's an image from the newspaper The Graphic um, and a couple of quotes by William Pargrave, who was a soldier in Bombay, uh, also a traveler and an Arabist. Uh, and the other one is by Captain James, uh, Thomas Mee of the, of the British Navy. Now moving to what I call the macro discursive level uh, in the uh, British metropole, towards the second half of the century, uh, the British Parliament started taking note particularly of the Zanzibar state market. Um, and the policy they were creating was really relying on a series of first-hand accounts uh, from people um, uh, who were linked to British India in general. Um, and and as, a, as a result of this, uh, there was rising criticism of allowing slave markets to operate. Um, by the 1870s, a select committee started to take note of all the economic possibilities of British involvement. And indeed, by the 1890s, both uh, Zanzibar and Oman would become direct or indirect British protectorates. Um, here, um, there's a quote by David, the famous Scottish explorer, David Livingstone, and uh, I think a really nice image from a French uh, journal called L'Illustration Journal Universel from 1849. And uh, the picture on the bottom is a really uh, fictionalized view of the Moscat slave market. Uh, one can notice the trees, uh, which are not necessarily present. Uh, by 1873, the British signed two identical treaties uh, with the Sultan of Moscat and the Sultan of Zanzibar. Uh, and a certain component of these treaties was the closure of public slave markets. Um, now, there were possibly multiple sites for slave trading in Zanzibar and in Moscat, and it's likely that the public sale of slaves uh, in Moscat in particular had ceased by this point. Um, and also, the British were well, well aware of extensive trafficking networks which merchants used to evade British patrolling. So why then the British, were the British so concerned by what was framed as a specific space whose banning did not really pose any real threat to the continuation of the slave trade? Even after their closure in 1873, uh, the anti-slavery reporter and their publication uh, were still evoking 
the image and the, and the memory of, of the Zanzibar slave market. So these are both from 1877, uh, and in, in both all issues, there's absolutely no reference to the Zanzibar slave market. So they're only using the, the, the images, and so it provides very vivid imagery, uh, which clearly came with important symbolic connotations. So thinking um, of the political economy of slave markets, there's an important link with memorialization. Uh, Jonathan Glassman uh, calls the this the, the monument to abolition, and this is a memorial and exhibition of East African slave trade in Zanzibar, which relies entirely on British sources. Um, Glassman shows the role of the historical memory of slavery and the racial construction of Arab slavery. Um, here is uh, one particularly interesting uh, example that I found there, uh, and this is a story of a slave. Um, what we see is a change by yeah, the, the Anglicans who are curating this exhibition on to the subject pronouns, so they're making it sound as if it were the slaves who were actually talking when it's really the, the British sources. So what kind of story would a different set of documents tell, uh, and could this affect memorialization? So I want to start thinking about future lines of inquiry uh, as a way to move beyond the market not only as a location, uh, but a set of practices and a set of relationships. Um, and I intend uh, for my project in looking at a uh, different set of documents, contracts, acknowledgements of debt, uh, fatawa that seem more concerned with the rights and obligations that with the issue of slavery and slavery uh, itself. Um, so thinking of markets more as sites, but again as relationship, as changing uh, business practices, uh, they can become an alternative site for examining circulations from the point of view of an increasingly economic, uh, regulated economic relationship, uh, particularly in the time of, of British abolitionism. Thank you. Particularly with regards to my talk, I, I'd like to engage with ideas of racial identity and particularly notions of blackness and how it's perceived in both Qatar and the greater region. Uh, and I found that it's a topic that hasn't necessarily been explored very much within uh, academic writing. And in the late 19th century and early 20th century, I find that this provides an interesting time period to explore this issue, not only due to the greater documentation of events, of course, but also because the turn of the century is a significant is a time of significant change, um, which includes the rise of interactions between British administrators, locals, and manumission. Although no singular narrative or understanding of blackness can be applied uh, or defined within this particular context, what emerge are multiple overlapping constructions of race, ethnicity, population distribution as a result of the extremely hybrid nature of local society, as we've seen in previous talks, of course, in this panel and otherwise. Um, and these are all, I, in particular in this presentation, I'd like to examine how notions of race and ethnicity and blackness are constructed and performed. Their relationship to the institution of slavery that persisted into the region well into the mid late 20th century and the roles and impacts of British administrative presence in this context. British officials in the Gulf during this period were heavily engaged in documentation of the population and environment, extensively demonstrated in the published collections of their collated records, in the archives, in correspondences, in writings. And these writings also show the attempts at collating the number of slaves, members of tribes, foreign workers, let alone engaging in surveillance uh, of major ports uh, throughout the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, and the Gulf. Uh, British administrative records in particular expose readers to numerous and instances of tallying populations and attempting to describe the different groups present in a region involved in particular events or even affiliated with certain groups or tribes or individuals. In one particular document um, that I read, which is a military report on the Arabian shores of the peninsula of uh, the Persian Gulf, Kuwait, Bahrain, Hassa, Qatar, Trucial Coast, and Amman, very long title, um, published and distributed in 1933. Uh, it's an example that mirrors what had been taken place throughout the European colonized world, whereby European administrators and military personnel would attempt 
to form an appearance of order within this document. We find descriptions of regions, climate, politics, and most significantly, population. And this attempt at describing the demographic breakdown is presented in tabular form with essentially three columns. You've got name of tribe or community, number of souls in Qadar, and where found in Qadar. Immediately, it becomes easily recognizable that many of these categories of tribe or community are highly problematic. The focus is predominantly on settled tribes, Hadar, uh, and family groups, with many of the Bedouin being excluded. The category of Arabs of Nejd also emerges as an issue um, with members of uh, with members of uh, where many of the tribal groups basically fall within a, within multiple categories or within one category. With uh, one particular example that you see is uh, baharna, which is a term that's extremely transient that emerge cons consistently within this term, and it's a label that differs from area to area. In what is now known as the UAE, the term refers to Shiite populations who speak Arabic regardless of their background. Uh, while in Bahrain, they've been and continue to, continue to be considered ethnically Arab Shiites. Ultimately, we see within this document figures of the populations of three different kinds of Negroes, which is the term that's utilized in the document, living in the area, which are listed as free, slaves but not living in their master's houses, slaves living with their owners. These are also not stable categories, uh, and they don't provide an accurate picture of what was going on. This document implies that all slaves are of African descent, reaffirmed in a letter written by uh, Captain S. Hennel, acting resident in the Gulf in 1838, in which he states that slaves are quietly brought direct from the African coast. However, it's well known and documented that there were slaves who were brought in from India, Iran, Balochistan, Yemen, and even as far away as Armenia and Georgia. The slaves who were of African descent were not perceived in a monolithic way. Of women, uh, of women slaves, those who were Ethiopian were considered by Hijazis to be the most valued, um, a belief confirmed by Snook Rongje and you know, with other scholars, of course, uh, working on this topic. And additionally, these categories do not explain or examine the situations of slaves within Bedouin tribes, where they may live separately but are unable to choose a particular location due to seasonal movement or those who engage in pearl diving who may only be living with their owners for part of the year. Despite their attempts at calculations and organizations, when looking amongst the different documents, numerous contradictions emerge. And of course, the infamous Gazetteer of the Persian Gulf by Lorimer, uh, readers find, as previously shown, that he adopts a singular definition for each term that frequently opposes those of other British officials. These significant inconsistencies emphasize the problems that arise with foreign British officials attempting to taxonomize society and its nuances in a, in a very simple tabular format. The end result is an outcry of mongrel, uh, decrying the heavily mixed status of those in the region, with skin tones ranging from the very Negroid to the light-skinned, light-complexioned Arabs, who would have passed dressed in European clothes as swarthy Greeks or Portuguese, and that's a quote. Nevertheless, what we see in all these records is an extremely clear visual display of the forms and constructions of knowledge that aid in, that aid in the colonial, colonial project. In his work, we witness the reconstruction of genealogy as key in his writings. He deploys Western style family trees to examine lineages of prominent tribal groups uh, and completely eliminating the maternal side. Uh, yet in reality, there were frequent intermarriages, uh, children produced as a result of concubinage, Therefore, many in society would have found themselves to be of slave descent. Children of slave mothers were regarded as equal in status within a mixed ethnic household. It's also important to note that despite what is depicted in these genealogical tables, society was not overwhelmingly patrilineal. In fact, the mother's house or tribe was often regarded as a sanctuary in times of hardship and could be counted on as a source of support. Furthermore, it effaces the power and status many slave and slave descendant individuals, particularly women, uh, which they had in society as practitioners of ritual and folk tradition. The British colonial officers, despite reporting numerous stories and correspondence, manumission testimonies, and internal records, still managed to strip away the agency of the people who were either not tribal or male. 
The focus in their discussions were primarily on policy and seeking to identify particular leaders who were endowed with much more hegemonic control than may have been the case. In the Hennel correspondence I mentioned earlier, he writes, with all our efforts, we shall find it impracticable to put a stop to a traffic which is sanctioned by their religion and immemorial custom unless it was relinquished by the common consent of the whole chiefs of the Gulf. A different story, however, emerges from other documents where we see they admit to adopting the same language that locally identified leaders, often having very limited power with little to no influence in the hinterlands. And instead of examining the realities and activities in which many of these people were engaged, they strip away any sense of choice, heritage, in, uh, in action, and even in belief claiming that Negroes generally follow the religion of their masters. Similarly, as clearly evidenced in Lorimer's geographic uh, volumes, there were significant efforts to acquire and collate as much data as possible concerning the region. A vast photography, mapping survey, and fieldwork projects had been undertaken, um, yet it wasn't solely collecting this information that was key, it was how it was interpreted and codified. By engaging in this kind of mapping, the British aimed to utilize it as a tool that allowed them to survey a large territory at a glance and permitted them to concretize, in their view, um, regional affiliation and administrative policy, in this instance, merging the Gulf with India. These kinds of activities, interventions, and writings all have a noticeable impact on how society functions and how the region itself continues to be viewed. The Arabian Peninsula today is seen as distinct from the East African coast, while comparatively the trading history, particularly during this period of focus, with India, of course, as we, <laughs> as we heard earlier, um, still remains very much acknowledged. Similarly, in many published works, such as the memoir of uh, Seyth Marzoug Shamlan, uh, a book of early photographs of Kuwait and a text on Qatari folk, uh, folk songs, uh, originally published in 1975, there's little to no mention of race and, and ethnicity with the, using, with the author's use of the, of the terms of Gulf national identity to refer to individuals or practices rather than acknowledging the rich and diverse backgrounds that were and continued to exist. I posit that the latter reaction is as a result of nascent nation building efforts with two of the three or four mentioned texts having initially been published very soon after independence, uh, which in many ways has resulted, I argue, uh, in the marginalization of certain minority groups and related topics in the region. Uh, however, this of course is outside the scope of this particular presentation. Local populations also express and perform understandings of ethnicity in particular ways frequently affecting those of non-tribal backgrounds, particularly slaves. Uh, tribal Arabs include those of predominantly paternal tribal lineage, although there were some free women who had married slaves. They were in a distinct minority. The majority of mixed ethnic marriages occurred through a system of concubinage, which led to the rise of the hybrid popu population that was mentioned before. Those with tribal Arab fathers and slave descendant non-Arab or tribal mothers would still be considered tribal Arab regardless of their appearance or comportment. Yet it's interesting to note that those of African and Indian descendant populations do make rather distinct references, particularly in folk songs, which are now considered traditional to the Gulf. Notably, examples of the former Shailat, uh, Shailat Tambura, entitled Zanzibar, uh, which has a chant-like rhythm with lyrics that include our father's land, Zanzibar, our precious Zanzibar, lovely and beautiful Zanzibar, uh, another folk song this time is uh, Aliwa describes an incoming art from Africa that is part of the culture. It includes a W. Cerne, uh, provides a very interesting demonstration um, of the enmeshing cultures that go beyond instrumentalization. Uh, this folk song is called Shenjoi. And although there are a couple of scholars who posit that it is a reference to Shango, um, which it is uh, which allows sort of, uh, they claim, performers to use music to harken back to East and potentially more Central African roots. Um, although more commonly it's understood to be a reference to Senjoi, um, a town in Baluchistan, in an area from where slaves were imported. Uh, these two examples have had direct references, uh, uh, yet in even within the rhetoric it appears. 
in a sea chant most likely led by the Naham, a member of the crew, many of whom would have been slaves at the turn of the century, who is mostly almost, al almost always associated with being of African descent, uses the plight of Ham as a metaphor for the troubles and struggles they face. Nubin songs are also extremely fascinating as they describe uh, the slave trade route as part of the song. Although there is a sense of affinity with much of the art that had been produced by these minority communities and an acceptance of the children produced within inter-ethnic marriages, amongst many members of the public during the period, one of the key aspects that emerge is that those who were descendants of or had been or were slaves at a certain point were still considered to not be fully a part of the dominant communities. Part of it had to do with the type of labor in which they were engaged uh, with many male former or children of slaves working in agriculture, growing date palms, uh, which was considered taboo uh, by dominant members of the population, and women engaging in such activities as public entertainment, which is also frowned upon, despite actually taking pleasure and enjoyment out of the activities. Uh, in manumission testimonies of former slaves during this period, it also appears as if the marginalization is not overtly based on race, but on status. In the testimonies, the structure is typically the name, place of origin of a person, where they're born or they were kidnapped from, uh, followed by their story, often summarized in a relatively short passage. Uh, in one case, a man describes having been tricked into slavery, despite having been born free. He went to debate to seek his fortune, and not having succeeded, he went to another town. He became acquainted with a couple of guys, one named Ali, one named Mubarak, <laughs> who subsequently offered him money to join them in selling perfume throughout the Gulf, from Ras al Khaimah to Deba, Kalbad and Sahar, and then to Bredi, uh, we of course see these same networks, these same port networks uh, being, in, being engaged, um, which was to be the final destination where he'd received his promised cut. On the way to the final destination, his companions hit him and decided to sell him into slavery, stating that he was Ali's slave, and ultimately he came under the service of a woman who sent him to Dubai to train as a pearl diver. Then found his companions and was able to escape and reach the nearest British administrative office to give his testimony. In this testimony, as well as others, the stories that these people describe can be of horror, abuse, isolation, yet they have struggled and in many cases succeeded in escaping their situations and expressing uh, what they've been through. In examining these narratives, it's interesting to see the use of the term khadim became the term of choice when discussing a slave, at least indicating a recognition of their personhood. They're also not completely without resources, knowing where to turn to in situations and emergencies. In some instances, they even argue uh, on the basis of legal rights to basic needs, as in the application of a slave named Nasr, who states that his master treats him badly and he does not provide him hence absconding, and recognizing their value and contributing to the income of the household. The lack of acknowledgement of this kind of agency is one of the problematic aspects of the British records in the Gulf. In fact, the awareness of their own worth and power, whereupon masters are frequently the ones who are dependent. Similarly, many women, particularly of African descent, especially of slave origin, have become powerful and respected figures in their own right within the wider community, affiliating um, and forming a myth around themselves, such as Sheikh Zar. And due to her unique heritage, she's considered to have the ability to alleviate illness and possession, uh, exaggerating the already held expectations of women needing to know how to heal, hence is regarded as valuable, but also potentially dangerous and mysterious uh, able to access a realm that isn't necessarily open to others. In times of hardship, mental and spiritual illness, they're often the figures in society that society depends upon, uh, despite any other reservations they may have held. Conceptions of race and ethnicity are a complex issue in Eastern Arabia during the turn of the century. Part of this is the fact that society was very diverse in terms of its population, resulting in contesting and multiplicities of ideas. Tribal Arabs had the most access to power, position, and wealth, with British colonial officers coming in with their own constructions, being politically in charge. And despite the situation, we do see those of marginalized minority groups, particularly slaves and non-tribal Arab migrants, able to engage with their own conceptions of identity and ethnic and racial performance. And also managed to craft and wield power, whether it comes in terms of economic dependence of their masters, awareness of their legal rights, even as slaves, 
art or even the spiritual realms. Thank you. Well, I think we have two papers today on slavery, and I think we'll have another one tomorrow. And there's also the question that has come up about memorialization. And I think this is where I would like to uh, enter. Memorialization has become a major issue now. How do you represent uh, slavery and slave trade? And for what purpose? And I think everybody has to answer uh, himself. But one thing is that we as historians, we are committed to finding the truth, to understand uh, what is sort of going on, and then to represent as accurately as possible. I think this is why the issue has come up, because a lot of the memorialization has been in terms of propaganda. And I think anti-slavery doesn't need any further propaganda. It has been going on for more than 100 years. What it needs is to explain to the population that is there what has happened in the past. And now you find, for one thing, that a lot of the um, studies still seem to be concentrating on slave trade. And I have no objection to slave trade, slave marketing as well. Um, but a lot of work has been done in the past, almost all the work that has been done in the past on slave trade, including my own work. But not enough work. The, the lady there, the last speaker, uh, did, began to do a good job in terms of looking at slavery, how it actually it operated. And I think the ignorance about how slavery operated here uh, in the Indian Ocean is really not very well known at all. Um, UNESCO, its um, um, slave roots program, is still talking about the Atlantic. And the assumption is that whatever that can be said about the slave trade and slavery has already been said in the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean is only a carbon copy. And a lot of the students who come, including some of the students from here, who will be coming soon, when I give uh, a lecture to, the, uh, to them and say, hey, Look at slavery here. How do you understand this? For example, one simple question, and a lot of that question has come up, that what kind of racism that developed in the Indian Ocean? Is it the same as in, in the Atlantic? And this is only the first question to ask. The other one is, you mentioned the word concubinage. What does concubinage mean? It's not the same as in the West. Concubine is slave owners everywhere in every slave society. You find men sleeping with slave women. And children are born, unfortunately, too bad in the West. The society, the law, doesn't recognize that union. And the children coming out of it are not recognized. And therefore, as Ali Mazrui said, both the mother and the child remain slave and black. But when you look at Zanzibar and you look at the, at the Gulf, you find, again, slave men slept with slave women. But as soon as the, uh, the girl, the woman, conceives, then she cannot be sold herself and she is freed, but on the, uh, um, the owner's death, but the child is free from birth with equal rights to inheritance. Now, when I, when I explained this to people and said, you look at Zanzibaris, I can bring you 10 Zanzibaris and I bet you'll be wrong in terms of your race to say who is Arab, who is African. Because there has been so, many, so much mixture. The last Sultan of Zanzibar, we saw the, the stem today of Said Jamshid, the last Sultan who was overthrown. If you saw him, and I saw him myself, he's completely black. But nobody would dare to say that you are slave. He was a prince. And all the rulers of Zanzibar, after Said Said, four children of his, were all 
children of slave women. Now, when you begin to talk about slavery as it really operated, then you begin to understand it. It doesn't mean that it makes slavery justifiable. The woman, and in fact, the students would ask me, but there's still a rape. And I said, yes, of course it is a rape. Because the woman doesn't choose. But I think it is, it is time now, I think, to begin to look, look at slavery as it ex- developed. And actually what I'm saying, what I say today, I'm not saying it for the first time. In 1870s, Charles, um, Christie, the doctor, um, missionary doctor, you read his chapter and you will be amazed. He knew all of this about Islamic law and writes about it. And yet, we don't deal with that. So one thing I would say is that we need now to look at slavery itself to go any forward. Pray that we can uh, quibble about numbers endlessly. But slavery itself is not understood yet. And I think this is uh, important. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to give yes. a chance to somebody else to yes. ask questions. Yeah. I'll, I'll take you. one more question and then I'll let the panels answer. Go ahead, sir. Uh, just <clears> to <throat> add on to Professor Abdul Sharif's uh, comments, there's also the notion, in addition to your discussions of concubinage and the birth of uh, children from slave mothers, there's also the need to discuss the difference between theory and praxis. So even within, you know, sort of the particularly Islamic understanding of, you know, once the, once the slave mother gives birth, uh, the child is free and she is free, that notion doesn't always actually practically happen as well, especially in the Gulf context. For example, there are oral history, which, um, and even just sort of anecdotes that even we've grown up with and individuals, et cetera, that we know from the region, who oftentimes they were not recognized as um, the children of, uh, of free men. Uh, and so their freedom that is supposed to be granted to them and that theoretically is their right was not necessarily granted due to the fact that their parentage and particularly their, uh, uh, their paternal lineage was denied, uh, sometimes for generations. So that's also something that, that needs to be considered. And I do agree in, with your point that we need to f- more immersively and fully understand uh, the ways and roles in which slavery manifests and uh, plays out within this region, rather than sort of attempting to necessarily just view it from the lens, which I, I think things are moving forward in the scholarship and people aren't really applying the Atlantic model anymore when regarding uh, Indian Ocean slave trade. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Sharif, uh, for your uh, comment. Uh, I mean, yes, I agree completely that uh, you know if we play with the truth, be it the numbers, be it the whipping post, be it the chambers, uh, the whole truth of slavery comes into question. Um, and yeah, I think the the Atlantic experience looms largely in the way in which uh, the Indian Ocean uh, case is viewed. Um, and there were, of course, fundamental differences both in slavery and in emancipation and in you know, the qualitative and quantitative aspects of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I agree entirely that it's fundamental to look at slavery itself, but I think there's also a lot of work to be done on the slave trade, uh, and that's where sources come in. Um, and, and I think it's very important to look at the sources and, and in, in my case, I'm particularly interested in the economics of slavery beyond numbers, but also looking at the relationship that they were enabling and the kinds of, of contracts they were producing and how they were changing those and how they were adapting. Um, and this kind of information is simply not present in British sources. And this is, I mean, this is a major problem because most of our analysis are reliant on British sources and British observations, which as we know are you know, job politically charged and, and they have great limitations. So, yeah. Um, about the Muhammad Jama Khan, there's some. There's an ethnomusicologist who actually just defended his dissertation on this uh, subject of Hadramauti uh, music in the Gulf, and and he has some some 
I don't know, side projects in Southeast Asia as well. So Muhammad Jamal Khan has a very long legacy. And the guy's name uh, is George Murr, if you want to look him up, M-U-R-E-R. -E uh, we have another question. Go ahead, sir. Also related to slavery. Uh, you know, it's very fascinating paper to see how the colonial officers played with the, you know, different racial categories and how they, you know, try to incorporate, you know, what is existing already. But like I was thinking of like a little bit pre-colonial or pre-modern uh, period where definitely the racial categories sort of existed, uh, at least theoretically, right? And you have that like long tradition of uh, people writing about like, you know, Suyuti, even before Jahir and so forth, writing about, you know, the importance of being black and, you know, on the, and along that line, there are also other works where uh, possibly not necessarily the racial category itself or the color of the skin uh, mattered, rather the regional affiliations where, you know, whether you're Abyssinian or Somalian or, you know, the larger uh, Sudan or like the black uh, 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 Africa sort of. So I was wondering in terms of like, you know, how that kind of categories you know, coexisted or contradicted or, you know, or took the colonial categorization attempts. Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, within uh, sort of the first part, uh, I eliminated it for the sake of brevity and uh, to get the point really for this presentation, but I do, dis but I do explore um, early notions of race and categories of race that emerge. Um, however, uh, when talking about sort of regional, I did mention it briefly in my talk. Um, there were understandings. However, a lot of these did not necessarily emerge within the British colonial records. They were within local documents. Um, Ahmed Sakinga's work, of course, examines this a lot. He talks about uh, slaves that, uh, in, especially in, his, in recent works, he talks about uh, slaves that come into the region. He examines documents uh, where it, bills of sale, which describe uh, slaves coming from East Africa based on location. Uh, but this is, this is something that I do wish to expand on. And especially the, the early modern and pre-colonial pre and pre-modern also in terms of notions of skin color, notions of uh, region, slave status or non-slave status uh, and how all of these interconnect, I do examine in an earlier section, which I can discuss further with you at a, a separate time. Thank you. Let's collect two questions because I saw two hands up. Yeah, are you first? In writing that part of my paper that I didn't get to share this morning, um, it was clear that um, the Persian uh, cultural influence on not just the Gulf region, but the Ottoman Empire as a whole was very paramount. I mean, Persian was the language of literature. And therefore, um, I mean, um, actually the Ottoman ideal, linguistic ideal, was uh, Turkish as a language of government, religion, the language of uh, sorry, Arabic was the language of Islam, and Persian was the language of uh, literature. And therefore, um, in associating uh, Persian with literature, we're really talking about the cultural um, effect that um, uh, Persia, even though it was not part of the Ottoman Empire, had on the whole of uh, the Ottoman Empire as an Islamic world. Um, and I'm... Um, I, I don't know the extent to which um, Persian also had a similar uh, influence on the people of the Gulf. I mean, it's, it, it must have, but I mean, how would one uh, try and document or um, uh, try and figure out how that cultural influence manifested itself? Since I'm, I mean, if, if we're talking about Persian as the language of literature, we're assuming also knowledge of literature, literacy, literary um, um, sources, and therefore it's a complicated um, connection that exists uh, between uh, Persia and the cultural influence that it had in the Ottoman world in particular. Okay, let's um, collect one more question. Thank you. Go, go ahead. 
Um, actually, I have uh, a couple of comments to make one follows up from what Mervat uh, was talking about. Okay, if you're making comments, can you make them quickly, please? Because yeah, they're going to be question. fast. Yeah. Uh, and it goes to Professor Olney. Um, I'm thinking here of the idea that uh, the Gulf, of, um, when they looked for education, they looked for Arab um, teachers rather than Indian teachers. If the first quote, quotation you used was so uh, correct, well, why would they? And um, here I bring up uh, a second question that follows uh, with, with Mervat, and that is the need to understand the uh, trade that goes on between uh, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean, and the Red Sea. We seem to take the Red Sea out of the equation of the uh, Indian Ocean, and yet we keep the, uh, uh, the Persian Gulf in, which does not make uh, much sense, particularly since we actually have written records from the Red Sea, whether on the uh, Arabian side or whether on the African side. Uh, you go to the different court records uh, on the, uh, for example, the port of Qusair, and you will see the extent of the exchange that, uh, uh, well, they were very familiar with India. They were exchanging. It was part of, the, uh, of life. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things we are trying to do with the Indian Ocean is to speak more in the form of uh, oceans and seas and widen the interconnectivities uh, that take place in circularities. So hopefully we'll even move into the Mediterranean and the, and the Atlantic uh, maybe in the next, uh, uh, in the next uh, at a meeting. Uh, the second thing, I couldn't let it pass because we've had a very big debate going on on slavery uh, here uh, and, and, uh, in Georgetown. And I just wanted to, to point out something that uh, we tend to always try to show that slavery was better off in Islam, especially when it comes to women. Now, when you walk into court records, I promise you you're going to find that the son of a slave uh, woman uh, does not inherit automatically. In fact, I, I'm reminded of a particular case where uh, the uh, ch the the uh, child, a boy, was born um, when the mother was a slave. The father actually married her afterwards, and he could not inherit. And when they went to court in front of the Hanafi judge, he said, no, he does not inherit. Because he was a slave, his brothers and sisters inherit, he doesn't slip. What I'm trying to point out is that one has to be uh, a little bit, you know, um, more critical when it comes to the uh, situation, the laws, how it's applied. In, in general rules, uh, fuqhi books, the way we Muslims like to think of it, yes, uh, it's a much different life. But in actual details, when we come down to the fact that a man can sleep with his uh, with, a, with a slave woman if she's married to another one because she's his slave and things like that, uh, that he can actually divorce her uh, from her husband, he can marry her. There are all sorts of little details that if you go into, uh, I think we'll begin to, to... I'm just sorry, but I just couldn't let that pass, particularly because of this debate we've had here at, uh, at Georgetown. Thank you. Go ahead, panelists. Uh, right, so on the question of, of uh, the influence of Persian on uh, Eastern Arabia, uh, this is part of a broader, very interesting subject of the wider Persianate world. That is, the world in which people speak Persian as a second language, um, and Eastern Arabia, which is, uh, denies that it's part of, or ever was a part of the Persianate world, because of, of course, the rise of Arab nationalism and, and the need to write out any, anything that doesn't conform to uh, the, the national narrative. So uh, it, if you, but there are influences. Uh, so uh, the, the most obvious one would be looking at the maritime terminology used in pearling and in the Tao trade. It's largely Persian. So if you read the works by Dionysius the Jews, he's written on this. Most of the terminology is Persian, which is interesting, because of course Arabs will say, ah, but the Persians don't have a navy. How is this possible? But um, nonetheless, it is, it is there. If you look at the, um, also the use of Persian, 
uh, it was a lingua franca along with other languages like uh, Sindhi and Kutchi and Gujarati in all the, the Gulf ports. But Persian uh, was, was the lingua franca. If, it, it was uh, throughout Asia. So if you look at Marco Polo or Ibn Battuta, how could Ibn Battuta make it all the way to, from, from North Africa all the way to India and then China? Where they speak Arabic there? He spoke Persian, right? Um, and Marco Polo, when he went to, to China, he, he spoke Persian, uh, not Italian. So P Persian was the, 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 the lingua franca. It was the equivalent of f French in, in Europe before uh, the 20th century. Everybody who was traveling and merchants and, uh, uh, and mer missionaries and so on spoke Persian. So it was not just the language of literature. Um, <clears throat> and beyond that, uh, if you look at the Persianate world and you try to map it, uh, you can in visualize it in terms of nodes. So there would be isolated nodes of people who would, who would, who would use Persian. Either uh, in a literary context, they, they would be writing it. So you, you have that, you have nodes of, of, of this, especially in, 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 um, in, uh, in India after, after the uh, uh, sacking of, of uh, uh, Iran, Persia in, 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 the, in the late 1300s with the Mughals. Uh, or Mongols, sorry, the, the, there's a, a, a move of, of these uh, scholars and writers and scribes and so on like that to Central Asia, to, to, uh, to Turkey, uh, which is why uh, Persian becomes in, you know, uh, uh, influential in, in, with the Ottomans uh, up, up until the um, conquest of uh, Constantinople and the establishment of Istanbul as the capital of the Ottoman Empire. Then there's a shift and Persian uh, up until that point, Persian is also, I think, used as a language of governance. But after that, it's, it's just relegated to the uh, <clears throat> literature and so on. Uh, wh wh whereas in India, uh, it, it continues, uh, and then it has a significant influence with, in, in the form of Hindustani, which the, is in the exhibition, explains how Persian uh, and Arabic, but Arabic through Persian, uh, is, is then in, absorbed into, into, these, into these languages. Um, and no doubt we see uh, Persian uh, loan words in, in, in Arabic, but they're, they're harder to trace. Uh, uh, but uh, so th there is that. Uh, if you look at the accounts of um, autobiographical accounts of, of Gulf merchants, they would uh, tell you about reading, you know, Hafez, uh, you know, and, and Rumi. Uh, everybody could, could recite these, these famous poems. Uh, and, and you might think, well, well how would an, uh, an Arab merchant do that? And I, I think that the answer is that people didn't necessarily think of themselves in those terms. Uh, the Gulf was very cosmopolitan, transnational, uh, and, and so one could be a, a merchant from Dubai and, and still recite the poems of Hafez and still have a family home in Karachi. Uh, these things were unproblematic. Um, it was only with the rise of nationalism and the need to, to separate everything that, that these uh, things became sort of, um, look, began to look from the present as, as uh, un unusual. Uh, oh, and then on the question of uh, Arab teachers, um, well, of course, the language they needed was, was, was Arabic. So um, they, uh, when, when the Gulf states, uh, uh, beginning, I guess, with Kuwait and Bahrain, were establishing elementary schools and then high schools, uh, they needed qualified uh, teachers. Um, so they, they, they sent out missions to places like um, Cairo and, and Beirut and Baghdad uh, looking for, for instructors, teachers. Uh, and this has been well written about, you know, uh, by others. But what, what these teachers brought with them, of course, was was the the um, was the idea of Arab nationalism, and they were teaching their students about the idea of the Arab world, uh, and it was in this way that Arab nationalism first began to to develop, um, uh, you know, in, in in the Gulf region. So the, and so it was it was a generational uh, thing, and and the, the an indicator of this would be the the use and the debate about the the name uh, Persian Gulf, Arab Gulf. It was very much a generational thing. So um, uh, Gulf Arabs, like say Kuwaitis in the 50s, uh, in if they were in their 20s, would argue it's the Arabian Gulf, um, whereas the government still used Persian Gulf on its stationery, its letterhead, uh, in its publications, uh, and so on. 
So there was this, this period of transition, which lasted until the beginning of the Iran-Iraq War. And then at the end, at the, the beginning of the Iran-Iraq War, the use of the word Persian Gulf in the Arab world became basically treasonous. So, uh, and you can quantify this using Google, you know, books to, or, or searching to, to look at the, the, the prevalence of, of uh, Persian Gulf in Arabic or, or you know, in, in and uh, to, to see this. But it, it, it so it's a, uh, I, anyway, I hope that's, okay. <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, break time. We can continue conversations during break and also dinner. Uh, let's th thank our speakers again. <laughs> So my name is Irene Pramod, and I'm a junior at Georgetown University in, Qat in Qatar. And my research on FM radio in the Malayali diaspora in Qatar examines the role of vernacular radio in South Indian, particularly Malayali, diaspora communities vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between home and work overseas in Qatar. It looks at this interplay between home and work under the lens of migrant leisure in radio production and listenership. Just to clarify, I use the term Malayali or Malayalis in the plural um, to refer to speakers of the Malayalam language, which is the official language of the South Indian state of Kerala. Pseudonyms have been used throughout this presentation to preserve the anonymity of my interlocutors and the radio station used as a case study. Through diasporic radio networks, I find that gender and socioeconomic lines are retraced, yet also negotiated in the host country. Even in the dig digital age, radio plays a critical role in mediating the lives of Gulf-based Malayalis, particularly single, lower-income, male and male and female um, Malayalis, Malayali migrants. By mediating, I mean that they maintain socio-cultural ties with their homes in Kerala, even as they broker their own realities and challenges through and as a result of radio networks here in Qatar. In addition, radio's AM and FM sound waves, I find not only trespass blockaded borders um, with the ongoing Gulf diplomatic crisis, but they also invoke nostalgia among um, the diaspora for their lives left behind in Kerala. A closer look at the dynamics at play here reveals interwoven perceptions of self, home, nation, and belonging among both Malayali radio producers and listeners. Highly affordable and accessible, radio uses migrant subdom or sound and voice to create and recreate spaces of sonic belonging with the Malayalam language itself as its airborne carrier across and beyond Qatar. I will now turn to um, <clears throat> my interlocutor Aji's narrative and her relationship to the radio, which is one that brings key issues to the fore. Aji is a single earning Malayali woman in her mid 40s who has lived in Qatar for over 12 years now and works as a beautician at a small Qatari-owned beauty salon within a shopping complex. She's brought to tears when I simply ask her, what does the radio mean to you in, in Doha? She replies, radio is my best friend. My friends know me as the radio lady because they know I always listen to it from the morning itself. I also go to sleep while listening to the radio. It makes me feel like someone is talking to me I feel very lonely here sometimes when I listen to the radio, time doesn't go so slowly anymore. It is a really good time pass. It is not like the TV, which you have to see and hear at the same time. When listening to the radio at home, I can also cook and do all the housework at the same time. The theme of Malayalam radio being a Malayali's best friend came up quite frequently in conversations with my interlocutors, particularly among lower income single male and female Malayalis. In Aji's case, the omnipresence of vernacular radio in her life is quite telling. She goes to sleep literally clutching onto the radio every night, listening to, quote, a man's soothing voice while falling asleep. She does a housework while listening to the radio before 8 a.m., which is when she leaves to work, and after 8 p.m., which is when she returns from the parlor, without the visual distractions of a television set. Lastly, she plays the radio during her workday at the parlor when given the chance to. The gender dynamics at play, however, are notable in the context of female radio jockeys typically treated as um, ear candy, if you will, for um, male audiences. Ajay directly flips this jockey listener association as a single mother whose romantic desires are fulfilled by a man's voice 
every night with that voice even aired across blockaded borders from Dubai. The radio for Aji, as it is for many other Malayali migrants, is more than just a source of entertainment or passive pleasure. It is an emotively charged means by which they transcend their various work-based realities into a realm of nostalgia and reminiscence of their lives left behind, but also brought back to life um, within their living and workspaces in Qatar. It is also a key source of companionship, namely sonic companionship that's impersonal, but it forms with the jockeys and their modes of speech, as well as with the radio content itself. Other Malayalis like, uh, like Aji in the parlor aggregate over their favorite radio programs during the day, while non-Malayalis, particularly Qataris in Aji's experience, very often demand that Malayali radios be turned off in the parlor, which is viewed as um, a public space in a non-Malayali workspace, even though the demographics of the employees and the majority of customers are Malayali, if not South Asian. Such a territoriality of sound created by Malayalam radio stems from the notion of a mobile landscape, which bleeds into both sound and sonic space, resulting in the creation of a Malayali soundscape. Ajay's hostile encounters with non-Malayali customers at her workplace due to her use of Malayalam radio in a non-Malayali space can be juxtaposed with the nature of the Malayalam language itself, both within and without the state of Kerala in South India. Historically termed as the Malabar Coast, the Indian subcontinent's southwestern littoral has been a vital part of maritime economic and sociocultural networks. The interactions between Sanskrit and then Arabic as a result of, of regional maritime sociocultural exchanges also led to the 17th century development of the Arabi Malayalam vernacular language. It is interesting to observe, however, the ways in which historical and linguistic continuities between the South Indian and Arab worlds are breached in contemporary attitudes in the Gulf towards migrants, particularly South Asian workers like, Aj like Aji. As Ajay and some of my other inter interlocutors' narratives suggest, their engagement with Malayalam as a migrant language is somewhat policed. Language is thus an exclusionary medium in the creation of non-physical space, or in effect, soundscapes, even along citizen migrant lines, situating particularly just the native migrant speaker within. Work, leisure, and work home binaries have also been heavily blurred historically, as seen in music making traditions associated with pearl diving in the Gulf and shipbuilding related folklore on the Malabar coast. In both cases, the maritime sphere associated with Indian Ocean trading networks is characterized by both familiar and hybrid sounds and a sense of community created through music amidst work at sea. But as Leith Alabi and others argue, Gulf states often prioritize the desert or the Bedouin life over the maritime, thereby projecting a more authentic and pure Arab identity relative to the multi-ethnicity associated with the region's Indian Ocean maritime history. We will now look at a case study of one of the main Malayalam radio stations here, based here in Doha. Established in Doha in November 2017, Radio Yathra FM, awaken the diasporic media landscape for local Malayalis like Aji, who previously relied on Malayalam radio stations airing from the United Arab Emirates. The GCC diplomatic crisis since June 2017, however, led to often distorted radio transmissions from the UAE. So when Radio Yathra entered Qatar's media landscape, Malayali cel celebrated its, in its introduction after a brief period of uncertainty regarding the future of the local diasporic radio and media scene. Catering to a wide range of listeners across socioeconomic backgrounds, from Uber drivers and housewives to company executives, Yathra has, from the very beginning, strove to use radio to, quote, send good vibes to its audience through its positive content-only policy. The station had attributed this policy to their objective to help Malayalis connect with the brighter side of life and fun that they associate with their lives back home amidst their often stressful work environments here. However, this pro Qatar positive vibe narrative is largely a guise for the station's obligation to adhere to Qatar's media laws that prohibit political news coverage of any kind regarding happenings in Qatar, India, or elsewhere in the world, as the radio station had told me. The radio jockeys themselves revealed their frustration with the need to adhere to this protocol, particularly when their listeners, 
a highly literate and politically inclined community, request for political, authentic, and current news coverage of the station is unable to deliver due to legal and governmental stipulations. An important reason for why Radio Yatra is central to diasporic Malayali life for many here is the sonic belonging that Radio Yatra creates within the Malayali community. This cannot be grounded in national or even transnational terms, and neither can it be explained by Kantian ideas of cosmopolitanism that fail to capture the sense of being at home in more than one place at any given point of time. Instead, the realities that emerge among Malayalis in Qatar are, I find, live not as contradictions, but rather as overlapping and normative phases of migrant life. As anthropologist Nehawara aptly put it, Indian migrants in the Gulf live in a state of permanent temporariness that they incessantly yet seamlessly weave themselves in and out of, even through diasporic radio networks. Malayali migrants consider Qatar, as well as the Persian Gulf more broadly, as home insofar as Kerala is their, is their home state, with the Gulf often viewed as part of Kerala itself. From the interviews I conducted and even through a broad overview of Radio Yatar's broadcasts, it is hard to overlook the gender discrepancies that rupture the Malayali Bendham or community created by radio both within and without the station itself. In terms of programming, much of the content broadcast is tailored to the kinds of employment or occupations that men and women are expected to occupy. Content for women in particular is expected is limited to home, beauty, and child rearing related topics during the hours that housewives are expected to be at home alone, um, with their husbands and children away until at least 1 p.m. A station headed Yatra des described the morning segments as tailored and dedicated to, quote, executives on the road and ladies in the kitchen, seemingly excluding the possibility of some ex executives being women themselves. Furthermore, during a 24 hour cycle of the program's broadcast, some advertisements and comedy sections are based on strongly gender normative content. These gender dy dynamics, however, must be contextualized contextualized vis-a-vis -vis the ideal Malayali family and the norms of womanhood associated with it. While the post-1970s Kerala model is typically used to depict Kerala and its people as, so, as progressive in sociocultural terms, there is a post-Kerala model patriarchy taking shape that cannot be dismissed in the homeland or in the diaspora, even in light of the radio content broadcast itself. This is particularly true given that the radio programs are intended to match the cultural realities of the target audience. The last part of this paper focuses on the gender dynamics between the female radio jockeys and the managers of Yatra, all of whom are men. The female radio jockeys at Yatra have achieved a near celebrity status among the Malayali expatriate population in Qatar. And over the course of my interviews with them, it became clear to me that they exercised their agency through their voluntary acceptance of and conformity with official norms and procedures, whether patriarchal or otherwise. Jay Devika and Binata B. Thampi's scholarship on these dynamics among Malayali women in urban governance juxtaposes female public altruism and Malayali femininity vis-a-vis -vis the ideal Malayali family and the ways in which Kerala-specific gender normatives are produced as a result. Over the course of my interviews with the female jockeys, it became quickly apparent that their unmarried, employed status away from Kerala was a central feature of the identities as jockeys in Qatar. They reiterated that they had, quote, moved away from family, were choosing to live independently in a new country for the first time, and now are making a name for Yatra by transferring their knowledge skills from prior employment and media firms in India to Qatar's Yatra station. Their acceptance of the existing norms and hierarchies in place therefore allows these women to venture into, become visible, and affect change in the diasporic public sphere. Therefore, for these women, the male-dominated management systems in place are somewhat, if not wholly, irrelevant, as they themselves mentioned. Their personal conceptualization of agency is not influenced by top-down employee relations, but rather results from what they, con what they themselves construct from an experience, both past and present. In conclusion, the one thing that stood out to me from this entire project was how the very mundane nature of diasporic radio in the everyday lives of Malayali migrants here in Doha 
lends an unexpected gravitas to the need for a shift in discourse on migrants in the Gulf beyond parochialisms of migrants as purely labor. What is Nadin or local and foreign for a Malayali at any given point of time when abroad in the Gulf is thus complicated at a foundational level and even interchangeable over a longer period of time. As a result, it is necessary to shift away from strictly defined home host binaries when attempting to probe the question of how Malayalis experienced home away from the Kerala homeland via diasporic vernacular radio. Thank you. Well, so two, I, I, by training, I'm a media historian. So there are two questions which, uh, so it's not Indian Ocean was kind of an accident, but increasingly it's, it's ceasing to be an accident. Um, I worked on a history of cinema and then I moved on to looking at amateur media technologies and the formations of political communities uh, in the um, Kerala region. Um, so I looked at amateur video movements. I started looking at audio cassettes. Uh, a very, very, um, you know, kind of scant attention is paid in Indian um, uh, media history uh, to the question of audio cassettes apart from one particular book. And it seems to be one of the most important site of different kinds of political and other sorts of articulations take place. Um, so in the audio cassettes, um, so generally in media history, there is a certain kind of site boundedness which um, prevails, by which I mean that it's either looking at a site of production, like let's say Bombay Cinema, or let's say uh, an industry coinage like Bollywood, um, or it's a national um, site like Indian Cinema, or, you, or it's a language site like Tamil Cinema, or Tamil Media, or Malayalam Media, etc. So the site boundedness, a certain kind of sedentary nature of explaining this was seriously challenged by uh, looking at the question of media technologies, media objects, forms, formats, genres, etc., that circulate uh, between um, different kinds of parts of uh, Malayali migration. And that's how I came to looking at the Indian Ocean space and how media objects kind of move across this. So that's the context in which uh, my work is placed. Uh, this presentation focuses on a particular genre of music called Kattu Patagal, um, roughly translated as letter songs, which is in itself a kind of derivative of a Mapilla Muslim um, genre uh, of a pre-colonial uh, time, uh, which has certain renditions in the post-colonial times. Uh, like there is first uh, something called a Burma Pata, which is uh, a Muslim man who is now wealthy through his migration to Singapore, but who gets tempted by a woman in the streets of Burma. Uh, and he's talking about the kind of difficulties in, in dealing with that challenge and so on. So that's, that marks um, as one of the first post-colonial uh, letter song, um, you know, uh, tradition, genre, so to speak. But the Dubai Kat is something which happens in the 1970s um, as... Uh, from the distressed agrarian sectors and villages of the Malabar coast, people started moving to the oil economies uh, in search of remittance in the uh, late 1970s in large numbers. Now, the Gulf market at the time is also an open market, an open market of different kinds of uh, uh, goods, media objects, uh, media technologies, forms, um, as well as infrastructures, uh, which makes it a kind of node through which these objects start traveling to South Asia. And this is a very well-recorded kind of history. So <laughs> 
ನಿಮಿಷನ್ ಎಂದೆ ಕಥೆಯು ಮದಾಳೆಂಗೂರಿ ಕರಕಾದೆ ಕರವ ಬಗ್ಗಿ ಒರು ಪಶುವಾಯ್ ನೀ ಮಾರಿ ಇರುವರು ಇರುಕರೆಯಿಲ್ ಯೌವನ ಚುಮಡು ಪೇರಿ ಇರಿಪದಿ ಎಂದರ್ಥಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಡುತ್ತ ಪ್ರೇಮ್ ಕೇರಿ ಉಡನೆ ತನ್ನೆ ತಮ್ಮಿಲಿ ಕಾಣಾಂ ಪೊನ್ನೆ ಉಡನೆ ತನ್ನೆ ತಮ್ಮಿಲಿ ಕಾಣಾಂ ಪೊನ್ನೆ ಅಲ್ಲಿಂಗಿ ತಗ್ಗಿ Hello everyone, I'm Al Ghalia, a senior here in Georgia University in Qatar. Um, this presentation is on gender and music in Zanzibar. This research was initially conducted for a class I took last year titled Gender Politics in Africa. So in this uh, presentation, I show how different locations shape discursive machines which help in the formulation of a country's narrative. In this research, I attempt to theorize on the origin and movement of music across an empire on the rim. I argue that ethnomusicology um, called landscapes and, uh, landscapes and inflection of phrase gender and class um, in examining Zanzibar, Zanzibar and Oman through social and political fields. Um, I argue that the exclusion of women in music is a symbolic move of bigger social and political history of the archipelago and its diaspora in Oman through gender politics um, behind Tarab music. Um, the word Tarab derives from the Arabic word joy or pleasure. Tarab is a Swahili cultural form of song poetry. Um, before exploring the gender dynamics in Tarab as a music genre, a general introduction Um, to gender dynamics in Zanzibari society is necessary. Um, a leading expert on Zanzibar, Laura Fair, writes, while it is true that today female and male subcultures characterized by various formal associations and informal networks, such as women dance societies, initiation societies, and help organizations, as well as men mosque affiliations, political organizations, and neighborhood, neighborhood coffee shops called the Barazas, there are reasons to doubt that the genders were as sharply divided years ago. There are also reasons to doubt that the current imbalance and power relations between Swahili men and women in favor of men existed to the same degree in the past as it does today. I explore these changing gender dynamics through different phases of the evolution of Tarab as a music genre, starting with Tarab as a rising music genre in Zanzibar, Tarab began as an elite, male-dominated, essentially Arab form of Zan um, in Zanzibar among the sultans and the elite class in Zanzibar. However, it evolved into a popular, um, essentially Swahili art form over the course of the first half of the 20th century. This transformation was largely due to the contributions of individual women, such as Sati Binti Saad and um, different bands and groups, such as um, Lili Mama Societies, which were made up of um, all women groups. Um, the second phase in the evolution of Tarab was the hybridity of Tarab, um, of the music, um, tunes, and lyrics. Um, Sati Binti Saad was the first woman to be recorded um, and she was, uh, her uh, tapes were, and vinyls were spread commercially over in Zanzibar and outside the island as well. Um, she first, she sang in Swahili as well as mixed Arabic um, poems and songs, um, which enabled her to, like, to be understood across the um, East African Ocean. Uh, which gathered a large audience across the East Africa. Um, secondly, she incorporated Nogma rhythms into Tarab, um, where traditionally starting off, it was mainly based on Arabic tunes and instruments, such as the Rood. Um, so here we see the hybridity between Arab and African styles, lyrics, and tunes. Um, the Lima societies followed her influence and continued with it to infuse Arabic um, nogme beats, creating the style known as Tarabiya Wanawaki, which, which translates to the woman's Tarab. Um, thirdly, um, the subject matter of her songs shifted from love poetry, um, which was the traditional source of Tarab lyrics, to topics of concern to the average Zanzibari, such as um, social affairs and uh, political, um, political matters. Um, so what Sati Binti Saad did was take um, Tarab out of the palaces and into the hearts of the ordinary Kiswahili-speaking Zanzibaris. 
Um, from the 1930s to the 1960s, um, the women's startup groups became the focal point of social lives of Swahili women. They were an integral part of weddings, funerals, and initiation ceremonies. Um, and these groups were also the only socially acceptable way for women to spend their leisure time. So a high percentage of women were involved um, in these groups, and membership meant that um, it was a way for women to expand their social networks. Um, the group has become a source of proud, uh, pride for the women, and which has also contributed to the creation of um, the cultural practice of rivalry poetry among the women. So the, we see a shift of um, love poetry to political, to as well as rival, social rivalries among the women being the main topics of their poetry and lyrics. The third phase of the evolution of in the evolution of Tarab is the phase of the Arabization of the music genre, which occurred um, due to after the revolution of 1964. Um, as a part of the campaign of the Arabization, um, the Afro Shirazi Party and the president at the time banned Tarab completely, um, as well as forcing the Tarab groups to change their Arabic Arabic names to African sounding names. Um, so the autonomous control that women once had um, no longer existed after the revolution completely diminished. So women basically lost interest in the new form of tarab that um, is through, uh, that evolved in the last phase of the evolution of tarab, which is tanga tarab, modern tarab. Um, so in the decades since the revolution, women have not returned to tarab as it changed and it gained um, influence from the mainland Tanzania and no longer had the influence or sound or um, even instruments that the women in Zanzibar played. Um, so Tarab, is, um, Tarab music as a space by women for women has been affected by social and political factors along with other women-only spaces such as female-only beaches um, and, and the, old, uh, the old fort of Zanzibar, which were previously um, spaces for women empowerment in Zanzibar society. Um, there are three main reasons for the shrinking of women's social and musical networks. So the main reason and the first reason was the, the revolution, which has caused the decline of women's tarab before the creation of modern tarab. There are modern day reasons, such as the Bushar tourism and the Zanzibari mentality. So um, tourism on the island and the commercialization of the tarab scene have shifted the efforts of, in the, of the music scene on economic gain, rather than having tarab um, as a space for songwriting and self-expression of women. So the, and the increase of male tarab singers um, meant that it was, became a male-dominated space um, aimed at, for the entertainment of um, um, tourists and tour tourism uh, groups, which resulted in a decline of participation of women singers as it became a heavily mixed gender or heavily male-dominated space. Um, the term Zanzibari mentality appears in the thesis of um, um, sorry, of Hannah Hayam, um, titled Voices in Zanzibari Culture, Performing Tarab in the Changing Society of Stone Town. Um, a student of musicology in the University of Oslo. The term signals the interconnection of Islam cultural practices um, in Zanzibar um, that limit the participation of women in the public sphere. So Hayam shows how the mixing of the two genders as well as religious reasons and um, social stigmas that prevent young girls or women from entering into Tarab um, as there have been cases of young uh, musician girls who have been sexually exploited by music teachers, um, as the the music schools on Tarab has have bec now become um, dominated by male teachers, and there's a lack of female um, musicians. So this has caused parents to be cautious and prevent their daughters from having a career on Tarab. So in the words of a music teacher in Stone Town named Bilal, he says, it could be religion, could be society, could be the men. So Zanzibari women have attempted to reclaim their lost um, social and musical networks. We're older, and it's part of a program where older um, generations of Zanzibari women remap um, female-only spaces that once existed um, to be recreated um, or reclaimed for younger Zanzibari women um, to create cross-generational female empowerment um, 
These spaces include physical spaces, as mentioned, such as the old Fort of Stone Town and female-only beaches, as well as the figure of social spaces of, of social spaces and network and music networks. Um, whereas Tarab for the Omani diaspora is centered around the misconception of presence um, and the word influence of the African impact um, on Omani traditional music. So Majid Al Harthi, the head of music and musicology department in Sultan Qaboos University, um, makes the distinction between the two clear by stating that Omani traditional music does not have an African influence, but rather it has an African presence. He makes the distinction through saying that to say presence is to centralize Africa and Omani society and music, but to use the word influence is to say that Omanis went to Africa, liked the music, and brought some of it back, which is not the case, he says. The music came to Oman with African people. Um, the traditional Omani music includes Tarab, which initially had the Omani and Arab influence. So Tarab is not, is, we see the shifts of Tarab, um, which continues to change form and style, um, and which always had and continues to have a feminine presence, which is currently being reclaimed by Omani women, as well as, as, well as Zanzibari women. Um, however, the feminine presence in Oman did not witness the same political and social changes that have shifted um, as they did in, Z in Zanzibar. Um, so to conclude, in the words of Majid al-Harthi, um, he says, I have always looked at the music not only for its aesthetics, but to see the people who made it. The people behind this music are clearly Omanis of African descent. Thank you. That there is, you, you claim that there is influence of the Arab uh, genre of Tarab on um, the Zanzibari one. Um, I wanted to ask first a question about the period that you're com making this comparison. Is it the 1950s and 60s, or is it the more the more contemporary uh, scene? Um, given the fact, um, well, another question is: How are you defining Arab? Is it Daumani frame of reference, or is it Arab in general? Because of course, the Tarab tradition in Arabic music is an old one, and therefore. Um, you, for comparative purposes, you may learn from um, basically uh, looking at other Arab uh, examples of the Arab tradition and how they developed in a way it seems like um, uh, a contrast to yours because they started off as a working class ending with Umm Kalsum, of course, who was sort of the height of uh, Tarab as high class. Um, but that's not the same... <clears throat> A trajectory that you you mentioned in your discussion. So I'm suggesting that a comparison um, with the Arab um, uh, cases might enrich your understanding of the difference between them and the Zanzibari uh, experience. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, yes, it started in the 1930s until the 1960s, where it was heavily influenced by the women and. You're totally right. It actually, the reason they had it, uh, it was a sultan that requested for Tarab to be brought back to the palace after um, he made a visit to um, Cairo where he witnessed the orchestra. And until today, even male Zanzibaris continue to sing Um Kalthum, even if maybe today they do not understand it or speak it. Definitely the presence of Um Kalthum in Zanzibar Tarab is there, and thank you for a recommendation. I'll definitely try to make that parallel more clear next time. <laughs> Tired, but uh, this is great. Thank you so much. And you reminded us about the importance of culture to try to understand the social change and transformations. Um, I'm completely taken by this cassette thing that you discussed. This one doesn't work. It works. Uh, I was wondering if you could just kindly answer a couple of questions because I think I missed a few of the points you uh, you made, and then I want uh, I wanted uh, um, to ask a question that deals with my own research. So if you don't mind, um, 
What happens, this cassette that goes around and that is answered, how, what's the mechanic here? I mean, I did not get that. So I, I, if you don't mind to explain this again, or you can do it later, but I would like to, to understand. The other thing has to do with uh, um, uh, sort of an imitation of a lot of the uh, material that's available on the net now that is more or less of, uh, of um, uh, you know, the British type of period uh, literature and movies and, uh, you know, um, uh, putting it in the form of um, a video together with uh, spoken words, letters. You know, there are some very famous letters the, that, uh, um, you know, were written, Jane Austen and things like that. I was, was wondering if there is some sort of a circularity going on here, but reappearing in, let's say, Indian aesthetics. I don't want to assume anything. I just was wondering if there is some... Uh, some sort of a connection uh, uh, here. I wanted to hear what you you had to say about that. Uh, now, my own uh, question is this. Do you have any cassettes that deal with uh, women, women or men that are talking about the fact that they are not married and that and the reasons for not being married? Because what, the ones you show here are all sort of romantic, but do we have uh, the, the other... Uh, uh, you know, situation, and if there are such cassettes, um, where can one find them? Thank you. Um, so there are the the one I have. Um, it's difficult to get access to cassettes. One, there is a question of privacy. I have some with me, um, and then there is a series of interviews which I have done. Uh, where people talk about their experience of living in the Gulf cities and uh, talk to me about them using cassettes for instead of writing letters. So letter writing is over um, written then by cassette practices in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, to to uh, to begin answering your question, so. Uh, I haven't come across any material which is otherwise, which is not, which is not about. Um, so people are not either. It was a practice which was specifically addressed to family members um, or wives, at times lovers, which is again a very, very secret. It has to be a very secret kind of, but it has. It used to be, and sometimes they had managed to uh, send cassettes across and. Um, get a response as well. But hardly anything which is um, about, and they do talk about um, their life in the Gulf, about um, the precarity of, a, of the life here, the hardships of labor. Um, so the, the themes of the cassettes are uh, very, very varied. Um, it's also about what you eat and what you drink and how you socialize and uh, about people from your village. And it's, it could be anything. Um, uh, but but the addressees are mostly your um, family members or anyone with whom you have a, some kind of an intimate relationship. So if if that is a way to, I I do not see a parallel um, between a Jane Austen kind of domestic fiction and this sort of um, practice. Rather, something which I didn't mention in in you know, hurrying to finish the paper was also that one of the, uh, apart from the avail the new kind of technologies coming, um, the other uh, most um, relevant framework is also a new discourse around sexuality, partly influenced by the sexual mores of the theocratic states, um, post-Islamic revolution, etc., which is already emerging here. Another is a print culture, which is um, have new sensational um, romantic slash erotic literature, which becomes very mainstream in the Malayalam language. So it's it's this that forms the um, frame within which uh, the genre starts developing its ideas about sexual morality and. Um, social anxiety around sexual morality, et cetera. I don't know whether I answered your question, but. Yeah. 
thank you all for these uh, papers. I, I have an open question for all of you, uh, and I just wanted to get your thoughts. It seems to me that one of the common threads running through all of your papers um, is the use of different kinds of media, especially music media, uh, to for women to get certain kinds of messages across. And I wondered wh what your thoughts were in terms of the types of media that are being employed to get certain messages across vis-a-vis -vis other perhaps more traditionally prestigious ways to communicate in the public sphere. Uh, what is the role of music as a form of gendered resistance, I guess, if I were to sum it up? In these. All right, thanks for your question. So in the case of um, my research in FM radio in particular, it's not exactly a gendered resistance that I see, but rather it's, I think there's a need to see how particularly the Malayali context and the, the ways in which there's something called a gen gentle power that Malayali women in the urban public sphere um, kind of exercise and that's how they exercise their agency. And this is particularly evident in the FM radio case here where they don't exactly resist even the male hierarchies or the norms that are put in place, but rather there's a very pragmatic approach that they seem to take. And it's not that they're being co-opted, but rather they just, they're still able to achieve the end goal of being visible, of achieving a near celebrity status, of achieving a reputation that they might not have might, might not have been able to achieve back in Kerala, um, or even redefine what urban governance means in the diaspora. So, in that sense, for in the case of FM radio, at least, there is it isn't exactly an explicit uh, gendered resistance. Whereas, I mean, one way you could say there is is the choice to leave. Kerala and come to the diaspora, that in and of itself is a very implicit form of resistance as they themselves said, as the radio jockeys themselves. But explicitly, it's, uh, it's kind, of, um, kind of cloaked under other layers. Can I, do I get a chance to yeah, answer him? It's an open question to the panel, should I? see a kind of um, uh, direct correspondence. Actually, everything that I see in that particular context um, is something which is very different from accepted high literature or high uh, modernism or high culture, etc. Rather, I see very subterraneous kind of uh, you know, currents going on around sexuality and desire and so on. So, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like an an assailable kind, assimilable kind of event. So for example, something which I didn't again mention for lack of time is that the, um, how uh, in their uh, memories of the of the of listening to this music in uh, cities of gulf men would there are descriptions of how men would get really upset and then uh, they would walk around and they would cry and sob and so on and so forth almost like a uh, and there are descriptions of describing it it's, it's almost like the ghost of the song came and possessed the they would become the protagonist of the song and then uh, experience it so this kind of this ability to see uh, the or see something else in the oral is what makes the whole cassette culture interesting for me rather than the visible connections with uh, you know accepted modes of literature i don't know thank you 